the way I want it, but that's all right. Let's pray. (laughs) Father, we do come before you today, and I'm thankful that even in the midst of technology that decides not to work, um, that you're still faithful and good and right and true. And Lord, I pray for more than this morning and more than our time gathered together. And I admit right at the moment I'm even a bit flustered maybe over the whole thing, Uh, but I, I thank you that you are faithful in the midst of it all, that you are good, that you're faithful not only to us but to Christians around the world. And I ask that you would um, be with them, that you would strengthen and empower them as Christians everywhere have gathered and are gathering today to worship you, maybe in a very different way than they're used to, that, well, uh, unfortunately, we've become used to it in many ways, of gathering in this manner where some are together and some are online. And... uh, But again, we thank you for that ability to do that. So, Father, I ask that you would strengthen and empower your people. Father, we know that so much of what is on the mind of the world is this pandemic. And how is it? Why is it like this? What's going on? How do we deal with it? We ask that you would help those who are in the forefront of treating this disease and doing research on vaccines. We pray for those who are affected by it um, physically, uh, family members who've had it and, and others, and ask that you would sustain and strengthen. Give our politicians and our leaders wisdom and how to handle it and how to deal with it in the, in the best ways that are um, good for all. Uh, good for the, the majority of folks as best as we can. Lord, it's, it is a difficult um, path to tread. And so we ask for wisdom and we ask for grace for ourselves towards those who are making these decisions. Lord God, we, we do give you praise. In the midst of that too, we, we pray, um, Lord, I, I, there are so many needs in our church. And I, I but in many ways, I'm thankful that there are so few as, as well. There are, there are important things that people are concerned about, and, and all our concerns, no matter how big or small they are, they are concerns to us. And I ask that you would um, guide and direct, that you would give peace, um, rest in the midst of it, We pray for healing for those who need healed. We pray for relationships that need mended. Lord, we pray as we think about, well, as we talk about marriage this morning and continue in that, we pray for the marriages of our church and ask that you would um, that you bring healing and hope and strength and unity and that the marriages here would reflect Christ in the church. Lord, we do give thanks and praise for Madison Joy Mull, uh, born on Monday, and uh, just the health, and, and pray for her, and pray for Megan and her recovery, and everyone doing well, and Abigail um, kind of integrating the baby into the family, and, and all that. Thanks for that, that, that family, and ask that you would sustain them. Lord, we pray those, for those who are not with us today. ask that you would um, strengthen them, guide them. Lord, we pray for Grace and Tristan as well uh, as they were joined together in marriage yesterday. And we pray for them on their honeymoon and in their life together as they pursue your call. Would you strengthen them in that? And thank you for the blessing that they were um, this half a year, really, that we had them with us. So, Lord, we thank you for today. We ask that you would guide us, that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts. Be with us, Lord, for your good, or for your glory and our good. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, if you'll turn in Ephesians. 
to our text this morning. Ephesians 5, I'm going to go back and start reading in verse 22 as well and read through the end of this chapter this morning. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church." because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is God's Word for you today. and We know that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of our God abides forever. Let's pray again. Father, do open our eyes and unite our heart to fear Your name this morning. We need You to open this text to us. It's a lofty call, but a beautiful one. So, Work in us by your Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, most of you have probably never heard of a man named Robertson McQuilkin. He was actually president of Columbia International University, which is a Bible college and seminary, a pretty prestigious school for many years. And I remember reading his book, The Great Omission, years ago on world evangelization, and it was, it was challenging. But his writing is not why I want to talk to you about him this morning. It's because of his marriage. You see, not long before their 39th wedding anniversary, Robertson began to notice something different in his wife. He, he, he saw things that were a little troubling, and so they decided that they'd go to a specialist and see what was going on. And in the midst of this, in a battery of tests, it, it came out that most likely Muriel was developing Alzheimer's. And as the disease progressed, life became increasingly more distressing for them. He was 57. He was the president of the seminary, and this was even, I think, a year or so after that. And he really, he loved his job. He wanted to make it to retirement at 65, but he didn't really think that Muriel could make it that long. And for two years, the balancing, the care for Muriel and his work was difficult. And he wrote this. He wrote, as soon as I left, she would take out after me. With me, she was content. Without me, she was distressed, sometimes terror-stricken. The walk to school is a mile round trip. She would make that trip as many as 10 times a day. Sometimes at night, when I helped her undress, I found bloody feet. And so you can imagine that McQuilkin wrestled with keeping his job. He had friends actually counsel him, hey, you know what? It's probably time that you put her in a home. Uh, She'll be well cared for. But that didn't settle well with him. He wrote, when the time came, the decision was firm. It took no great calculation. It was a matter of integrity. Had I not promised 42 years before in sickness and in health till death do us part, this was no grim duty to which I was stoically resigned. However, it it was only fair. She had, after all, cared for me for almost four decades with marvelous devotion. Now it was my turn. Such a partner she was. If I took care of her for 40 years, I would never be out of her debt. See, Muriel was his delight. He didn't have to care for her. He got to. And that was his attitude. And when he made the announcement of his re- resignation, it caused a stir that shocked him in so many ways and in ways that he never expected. And he, he wrote this. He said, husband and wives renewed their marriage vows. 
pastors tell the story to their congregations. It was a mystery to me until a distinguished oncologist who lives constantly with dying people told me, almost all women stand by their men. Very few men stand by their women. Perhaps people sense this contemporary tragedy and somehow were helped by a simple choice I considered the only option. That's amazing. It's the value of marriage in a society where marriage has been devalued significantly. Not only has marriage been devalued, but honestly, our culture doesn't even know how to define marriage. It's become utilitarian. It's become whatever we want it to be. And that's why it's not surprising to me that the call for husbands to love their wives It's not understood. It's not really obeyed by many. Last week, we addressed the call to women to submit. And I don't know how many wives felt at times throughout the message that their failures were being exposed. It's not surprising. I'm sure it happened. We're all sinful people. Because I certainly felt that in my own role as a husband this week as I was preparing this message. I see it, uh, I see myriad areas in which I failed to live up to what God has called me to both do and be as a husband, and it honestly grieves me. The call to love your wife is a massive responsibility. To love as Christ loved and loves His church is daunting. It's a bullseye that's honestly impossible to hit. However, we are called to long and labor for this through the empowering of the Spirit in our lives. We have to remember that this is all within that context of the command, be filled with the Spirit. This is an expression of the Spirit-filled life. And today, as we look at this, it's going to be fairly straightforward. Our outline is just two points, (laughs) just two points, the example of Christ and then the exhortation to husbands. It's going to be straightforward again, and it's going to be principle-based. Not going to get into a ton of details of how this has worked out, but more principles. And in this, I hope what we see is that the call to husbands has to be framed in the light of Christ, in the light of the gospel, and that we know that our ability to follow this command can only flow from a life changed by the love of Christ and governed by grace. And I want to say that though this is aimed at husbands, this will have application for all of us. As we see the principles of love, the example of love that Christ set for us, how amazing it is to be in relationship with Christ, this this beauty of union with Christ that though maybe not explicitly brought out in the sermon throughout, it is there all the way for those who are part of the bride of Christ, His church. So, the example of Christ. We see it first in the instruction to wives. We see that Christ is the head of the the church, His body, and is Himself its Savior. Now, what this speaks to is quite simply the authority of Christ. We addressed that last week. Yet, we cannot miss that this authority is clearly made visible through service. That headship was made most visible through service. Christ exercised His headship for the good of the church through life as a humble yet mighty servant. But then we get into our section that is directed specifically towards husbands, and it's filled with the example of Christ, the command, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, as, that, that is pointed to follow this example. Now, how did Christ do that? Romans 5, 8, but God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He gave Himself up for us, Ephesians 5, 25. The verb that Paul uses there for He gave Himself up, it stresses that Christ was the initiator. This was not forced. There was nothing behind it. He gave Himself up to death. We see this in chapter 5, verses one and two as well. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. See, that call there in in 5, 1, and 2 is for all believers to imitate Christ, 
to, to follow that, that self-sacrificial giving, that self-sacrificial love. And in our text, though, in, to husbands is where Paul particularly turns. And Christ's example is the foundation of that exhortation for husbands to sacrifice their lives, their interest, their time for the good and well-being of their wives. Folks, though Jesus gave Himself up for the church in the ultimate manner on the cross, one thing that I think we forget is He gave Himself well before that. He gave Himself well before that, humbling Himself to take on human flesh and frailty. He sacrificed from the very beginning. And without His service and His life of perfection, His life of service, He would not have completely fulfilled the law, and we would not have that righteousness imputed to us, that perfect record that that was given in exchange for our sin, the sin of the bride on His cross. It is His steadfast, sacrificial love for the church that so deeply characterizes who our Lord is. And Paul highlights the nature of this sacrificial love and what it was for, what it accomplished. If you, if you look, there are three purpose clauses. You probably noticed it in many ways, that each contain the phrase, that he might, or one of them says, that she might. It's, he died, he gave himself up for her, that this would happen, okay? Verse 26, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water. Verse 27, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, and then that she might be holy and without blemish. Looking at the first then, that he might sanctify her. That is, that he might set her apart for God, for himself. Christ separated the people of God. He separated the church for himself. This sanctify here is not so much focused on a progressive growth in holiness. That that's comes later, but that's not what he's talking about here. Right here, he's talking about the, uh, the fact that in Christ's death, he laid full claim to his bride and separated her from the world, from that which is unclean and evil, and he set her apart to do the will of God. See, as he separated the church, he cleansed her through the washing of water with the Word. It's a picture of spiritual cleansing. Perhaps it's, a, it's an allusion to the bridal bath that would take place before the wedding. But I think the most important thing that we see here is that this cleansing, this, this washing was done through the Word, through the Word of God, through the Word of the gospel. I think of Acts 20, 32. Paul is saying goodbye to the Ephesian elders, and he says this, and now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I commend you to God and what? To the word of His grace, which is able to build you up. It is among those set apart for God, the church, the people of God. It's this word of His grace that is able to build you up. And that is what Paul commended the Ephesian elders to, so that they would take that to the church and help the church continue to be cleansed. And further, Christ gave Himself up that the church, by His work, might be presented to Himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. John Stott wrote, the bride does not make herself presentable. It is the bridegroom who labors to beautify her in order to present her to himself, his love and self-sacrifice for her. His cleansing and sanctifying of her are all designed for her liberation and her perfection when at last he presents her to himself in her full glory. Paul wrote in Colossians, chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. He said, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, there's that, the work of Christ, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Consider this for a moment. As full of failures and blemishes as we are as the church, 
we will be characterized by holiness and blamelessness on the day of the great wedding feast of the Lamb. We, we will be fully changed and fully conformed. The day when Christ, the bridegroom, returns for His bride. But there is still a point to that holy and blamelessness that isn't just future. It refers specifically, and especially when you consider the message of the great prophets throughout the Old Testament, to the purity and fidelity of God's people to the Lord. Being holy and blameless as the church is to be living in soul devotion to the Lord, not chasing after other suitors, not chasing after other gods. John Calvin wrote, the true beauty of the church consists in this conjugal chastity that is in holiness and purity. So that's one thing that I, I think all of us can consider right now as the church, is what is your devotion to the Lord like? Is it in holiness and purity? Is it full chastity of the Lord? Are you chasing after other gods in your day to day? Think about your role as the bride of Christ. Well, moving on from that, these three purpose clauses, we see another aspect of Christ's love in verse 29, where it says, He nourishes and cherishes the church because it's His own body. Here we have the mystery of union with Christ, that we are in Him. We are vitally connected to Him. We are united to Him in, in His fullness in many ways. We are His body. We are one in Christ and one with Christ, and He takes care of the church. And there is this wonderful, strong tenderness to the Lord as He cares for His bride. He's not averse to the church. He's actually drawn to us, even in our sin. He's drawn to us. He delights in us. He pursues us. He provides for us. Folks, that's quickly through the example of Christ. The, the, these last week and this week could easily have been a series in and of themselves. But I wanted to give the principles of this. And, and here's the example of Christ that the husband is to follow. And it is the basis, we have to know that. Paul continues to work that same way, right? He says, this is what's true, this is what then you are to do. So this is the basis of the exhortation given to husbands in relation to their wives. So as, as we move into what this text says to husbands, we're to seek to figure out what it demands of us as husbands. Now, the first aspect that we see, that we saw there, was headship. And headship is quite simply a reality. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. However, what you also need to see is that there is absolutely no command that says, husbands, go exercise your headship. Demand that your wife submit. There is no command there. The husband is not told that. What one commentator said, biblical headship is simply the exercise of God-given authority whereby a man does all that is within his power to see that love, justice, and mercy rule in his home, even when fostering such qualities requires his own personal sacrifice. Folks, headship is not a matter of dominance nor passivity, which we often see in houses as well. It's a matter of loving self-sacrifice in leadership. The role of the husband is redemptive. It, there, there's a redemptive aspect to the husband. The husband is to help everyone in the home, first and foremost the wife, to apprehend and bask in the grace of God. To apprehend and bask in the grace of God in Christ. And so, when we think about Christ and His headship, another thing that we see is that Christ's headship does not crush the church. Instead, as John Stott wrote, He sacrificed Himself to serve her in order that she might become everything He longs for her to be, namely herself in the fullness of her glory. Just so, a husband should never, never 
use his headship to crush or stifle his wife or frustrate her from being herself, his love for her will lead her to an exactly opposite path. He will give himself for her in order that she may develop her full potential under God and so become more completely herself. That's what a husband's headship is to do. And then we actually get to the command. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Love her. Give yourself for her. And I I believe that most husbands would not hesitate, would not hesitate for a moment to give their lives for their wives. And perhaps, even as a husband, you've daydreamed a little bit, okay? Don't look at me like I'm weird, but you've maybe daydreamed about fending off an attacker, stopping her from something, pulling her out of a raging river, or saving her from something. And that's great. That is wonderful. You should be willing to do that. But let me ask this. How many of us have ever daydreamed about doing the dishes or the laundry or holding her hair back when she's sick or coming home and making dinner when you've had a horribly long day, but so is she, and you're going to sacrifice because her day has been just as long or even longer than yours? When do we daydream of giving our lives in the day-to-day, not in some blaze of glory, When do we daydream of studying God's Word with her and praying and seeing her grow to be more and more who she was created to be? Folks, there has to be an everydayness, an everyday aspect to the love of the husband for his wife. As far as human relationships are concerned, this is the closest and most primary relationship there is. James Boyce, in his commentary, he quoted a man named Walter Trobisch, who was kind of famous for um, counseling young couples and and others about marriage and, and relationships. And he gave this definition of love. He said, let me try to tell you what it really should mean if a fellow says to a girl, I love you. It means you, 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 you alone, you shall reign in my heart. You are the one whom I have longed for. Without you, I am incomplete. I will give everything for you, and I will give up everything for you, myself, as well as all that I possess. I will love you alone. I will work for you alone. I will wait for you. I will never force you, not even by words. I want to guard you, protect you, and keep you from all evil. I want to share with you all my thoughts, my heart, and my body, all that I possess. I want to listen to what you have to say. There is nothing I want to undertake without your blessing. I want to remain always at your side. That's a pretty complete picture of love and of self-sacrifice. Governed by the grace and love of Christ that has to empower a man who can say that. As we look back to that love then, that love of Christ, those purpose clauses, what Christ's love, what Christ's love does for the church, when you think about what it does it, is it beautifies her. It makes her more who she was created to be. It separates her from what is evil and wicked, and it's a love that protects her. And the love of the husband is to act in the same manner. Now, when you look at those purpose clauses, those those clauses in some way are unique to Christ. But they still provide an example and an impetus for the husband. They show us the result of true love in action. And beyond that, and perhaps even more importantly, one commentator said, Christ's model demonstrates a love towards someone who is not perfect or purely lovable. In the case of the church, she is full of warts, wrinkles, and impurities outside of Christ's loving consecration and cleansing. And men, no matter how great your wife may be, she ain't perfect. She is not purely lovable. But yet we're called to love. Just like she is called to submit when we know awfully darn well that you ain't perfect either. 
Now, when you think about some of this role as the husband, let me just stop you here from getting your knight in shining armor complex. You're not here to save your wife. You are one redeemed sinner pointing another redeemed sinner to the Redeemer. It is only through the work of the God of grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ that we will be conformed, any of us, more to the image of God and be more what we are to be, to be actually more human. It is not the husband's job or the wife's job. It is not the husband's job to change his wife. However, however, it is the husband's responsibility to provide an environment of love governed by the Word of God that will be the key ingredient to growth in all parties. Okay, so did you hear that? It's not our job to change our wife. It's not, it's, that's not for us. It's not that our responsibility in that way, but it is our responsibility to provide an environment where the Word of God and the grace of God reigns and where growth is typical in many ways. Now, following those purpose clauses, Paul makes an argument drawn from nature, starting in verse 28. He says, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church because we are members of His body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, Paul argues from this, every man loves himself. Every man loves himself. But he also says, every man who's a husband cannot love himself if he does not truly love his wife. If he does not rightly love his wife, he is not actually loving himself. And as Calvin wrote, that man who does not love his wife is actually a monster. Paul appeals back to Genesis 2.24 as the basis of this, and that one flesh union that man and wife have in marriage. That's the design of marriage. And if we are to take marriage seriously and the design of God seriously, then a man who is joined to his wife, is one flesh, he must love his wife if he actually thinks he's loving himself. If he does not love his wife and does not love her well, he is really showing that he doesn't love himself, and he is actually bringing trouble on his own head. Okay? If you don't love your wife, she's going to know that. And we're all sinners here. It's going to bring trouble back on yourself. So there's a bit of a almost utilitarian, but a natural argument of you're one flesh. Love her because she is your body. Christ loves the church because the church is his body. That's why another reason we are to love. Because if you fail to, you're hurting yourself. So rather, what are we called to do? To nourish and cherish her. There's a tenderness, a nurture, an affection. When my kids' friends found some abandoned kittens, kittens, yeah, I could have left them abandoned myself, but that's just me. Um, my daughter desperately wanted to foster one of them. Well, she desperately wanted to keep it, but we were ag agreeable to foster. And in that, in that time, I actually saw someone who nourished and cherished. It was a beautiful picture of nourishment and cherishing. She was gentle. It hurt her when the kitten didn't seem to thrive, didn't seem to be doing well. She protected her. She sought what was best for her. And I think in many ways, husbands, you are to act in that way, to be gentle, gracious, protective, caring, tender, compassionate, understanding, as, as 1 Peter 3, 7 says, showing uh, honor to your wife. Think through what nourish and cherish means. And I want you to, to know this. 
Guys, this isn't a suggestion. Where we read, in the same way husbands should love their wives, the word that's translated should is a word that actually means you have an obligation. You, you owe this. This is just part and part. This is something that is demanded of you. You love your wives. It's your duty. It's your obligation, but it should also be your delight. Folks, the call is to love by giving of oneself. That is so much what the example of Christ says is, give of yourself for your wife. Sacrifice. The husband is to serve his wife through self-sacrifice. And this is not easy because we all want what we all, we all want what we want. And when we don't get it, we don't like it. And we don't like to sacrifice. We're all naturally self-centered, and we'd generally rather be served than serve. But the husband is to love his wife as he wants to be loved. There's, there's a golden rule aspect to this. So consider how you want to be treated. And actually, this might find out how your wife wants to be treated and treat her that way with gentleness, with nurture, with care, with compassionate, with tenderness, with love, with self-sacrifice. Do it in an understanding way, knowing that your wife is different than you. The husband is to nourish and cherish. You know, speak to your wife words of affirmation. May she know of her beauty both inside and out. A husband's wife should know how much he delights in her. She should not question that. And from the example of Christ, even when she's not perfect, which she's not. Just a couple practical things that I think will help in this process. Are you praying for your wife? Not that she'd change, but that God's love would be more and more known in her life, that she would have deeper and deeper intimacy with her Savior. Are you praying for yourself to have the strength to love your wife? Are you praying with your wife? Are you reading and meditating on Scripture together? Are you enjoying one another? Are you having fun together? Folks, we could go on and on with applications. It could be made from this text. And if you're a husband, guess what? You get to figure that out. That's what you get to do. And, and picture it as a get to, not as a, dang on, I got to figure this out. You get to figure out how to encourage and sacrifice for your wife. What Paul's laid out for the husband, well, I think it could be a bit discouraging because it's massive. It is massively all in there, there are a lot more words to husbands here than wives. The, the message to the wives was not so countercultural. The message to the husbands, yeah. It absolutely was, and it still is today. But rather than viewing it as discouraging, see it for the privilege that it is. Just as we saw with McQuilkin, you know, in some sense for him it wasn't a sacrifice because it was done out of love and out of desire. And this is the viewpoint that we all, we all want to and need to grow in, and not just husbands but wives and children and friends because loving others is not a burden. Loving others is not a burden. It's a joy. 
It's a joy to reflect the greatness and character of Christ in our steadfast, self-sacrificial tenderness. As husbands and as all believers, as Hebrews 12 says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross. He endured the pain. I'm not saying self-sacrifice is easy, but for the joy set before of seeing your wife grow to be more and more of who God has created her to be, that's the joy that's set before you. And folks, that's where we must rest, in Christ. All of us, as the bride of Christ, must cling to Him and rest secure in His love if we are to ever be able to serve. McQuilkin had one other insight, and he wrote that Muriel's actions to Him, they challenged his devotion to the Lord. They challenged the way he viewed his relationship with the Lord, and they taught him much about desire to be with God, to be with his bridegroom. Because Muriel was so desperate to be with her bridegroom, she would walk up to ten times a day, sometimes getting lost, being willing to have bloody feet just to be with him. She would do anything to be there. She knew it instinctively that that's what she needed. She was only secure. She was only herself when she was in the presence of her love. Folks, you and I are only secure. We are only ourselves when we are in the presence of Christ. And let us rest in that, in this call as husbands to love our wives and as all to love those around us. Let us rest in Christ's love and serve in and from the fullness of that love. Let's pray. Father, make us to know more of Christ's love. Help us to know what it is, you know, to be challenged in that, that we would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge grow that in us, that we would serve and love as husbands, that we would serve and love others. Help us to know that beauty of union with you and give us that deeper desire to be with our Savior in whom we have strength and hope and rest. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.